Hi everybody, Tim here. Uh, I want to welcome you to the first video for the Chicago and Northwestern Wisconsin division in N-Scale. I'm really excited to get this project off the ground and get this first episode up here uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, not only to share with you all, but also I feel like this will be a great way to hold me accountable and make sure that I stick to my, my plans and my targets to get this layout done. This is a project I've wanted to work on for years and years. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a simple loop of HO track around a you know on a four by eight sheet of plywood. Uh, when we first moved into this house over a decade ago, I tried to get an HO shelf layout going, um, and I got through bench work and initial laying of the track and everything. But uh, then I lost my space because we had our first kid and. You know, she probably needs a bedroom. So I had to put my model railroad dreams on hold for a while. But in the intermediate years, I've always had a layout in the back of my mind. Um, my dad worked for the Chicago Northwestern for years. And then that's why we made the move out to Omaha was because the, the Northwestern got bought by Union Pacific. So I knew that if I was ever to, able to do a layout, it would have to feature the the C and W, and as I got older, I thought about what I really wanted in a layout, and I really started to think about going N scale over HO, and that's because I really like seeing long trains over a fair amount of scenery. Operations cool, but it, I'm less into the switching, you know, of smaller of smaller trains and more into seeing larger trains run through scenes. Um, and I just don't think I'll ever have the space to do that to the extent that I want in HO. And uh, also, you know, growing up, before we moved out to Nebraska, growing up in Itasca, Illinois, I was within walking distance of the metro station, so I also knew I wanted to feature a lot of passenger rail, and specifically commuter rail. And I just, again, felt like I could run those trains more to how I wanted them to look in N scale versus HO. And the final nudge that really sold me on moving down to a smaller scale was when my uncle, uh, who has been a model railroader for as long as I can remember, uh, he very generously gave me a number of N-scale Northwestern freight cars and even a couple Northwestern Pullman bi-levels. So that, that sold me. I knew if I was going to do a layout, it would have to be N-scale. So over lockdown, I started putting my plan together. Uh, I began to acquire some locomotives and some additional rolling stock. I started testing out you know, my skills again, did some soldering again, wired up some test track to a DCC system to check and see if everything that I was buying was you know, working properly, and, uh, and really started to get motivated at that point. Uh, initially, so I want to do, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, you know, I want to do a modern layout, uh, so I want my main line to be uh, concrete ties, not, not wood. So I played around with uh, Pico's Code 55 flex track, but I wasn't a fan, you know, because it's, it's got the, the sleeper spacing, you know, more for, for British rail than American, it just didn't look quite right. So then I, I dabbled with some Kato Unitrack for a while. Uh, for a long while, actually, even you know, I built up some some shelf sections with some extra lumber and foam that I already had. Uh, I wired a couple of them up uh, to make sure I could wire multiple rails all right. Um, and and I, and I was stuck on that for a while. I was going to do that, and I loved the simplicity. Um, but I started to run into some issues because I I wasn't a fan of the lack of flexibility. Because at, at the end of the day, you know, unit track it's all sectional track. Um, the other thing, and this might sound really nitpicky, but it was hard to ballast. Uh, and, and most folks, you know, that I've seen, it's not that you can't ballast Unitrack, uh, but the folks that do, they'll, they'll use some kind of blend of gray to work with the plastic roadbed that's already on the Unitrack. But this is going to be a Chicago Northwestern layout. And those of you familiar with the actual Northwestern know that they have their, their pink lady ballast that they used on their lines. And I wanted to use that on my layout too. So I finally settled on uh, Microengineering's Code 55 uh, weathered flex track with the concrete ties, and I'm really pleased and I'm really excited to use it uh, for the layout. Now, it's important to share <laughs> that right now I have literally no space for a permanent layout in my house, none whatsoever. 
But in three or four years, uh, we plan on moving into a larger house. So what I'm gonna do in the meantime is build a small layout uh, on modules that I can set up and tear down. It's kind of a version one of the Wisconsin division uh, to get some experience in construction and operation. And that way I can feel really confident about you know, my skills, about what looks, what functions well for operation and all that stuff when we move and I get a chance to build a full scale permanent layout. So, so let's talk about the Wisconsin division then. I, I really like modern 21st century railroading, which on the surface is a bit of a problem since the CNW hasn't existed since 1995. So, you know, I'm a history teacher. I'm really into background and kind of setting the scene. Uh, and so I decided then to make that work, I'm gonna do a little alternate history. Uh, and I, if you're familiar with Apple TV's show for all mankind I'm gonna steal from their playbook a little bit because in that the premise behind that show is they change one event in history um, to create a completely different version of the space race so I'm gonna change one event in history to create a different history of the Northwestern uh, to create a different railroading world where the Chicago Northwestern is still around in 2021 but I didn't just want to say that they avoided purchase by the UP in the 90s because if you're familiar with the history of the Chicago Northwestern at all, that had been building for years. That was almost inevitable uh, that when they were acquired in 1995. So I wanted to create a plausible backstory to explain why the CNW is still around in the 21st century. So in, in the real world, uh, there were several flirtations with merger with the Milwaukee Road, uh, dating back to you know around World War II through the 60s, um, and then the Northwestern made one last attempt, uh, I think, in the 80s. So in my world, I picked uh, there was an attempt around 1964, and in my world, I'm going to say that did happen, uh, where but rather than a, a merger, um, the Northwestern just outright acquired the Milwaukee Road. Now, I, I read up on the, the 1964 plans, and I decided that in my alternate history, we're going to follow it pretty closely because it called for a lot of pretty immediate abandonment of, you know, duplicate lines, unnecessary branch lines, you know, all of those things. And so the Northwestern would immediately sell off a ton of duplicate lines and consolidate their customers uh, to make a more profitable railroad. And probably the biggest stretch in my alternate history uh, is that they're going to keep the Pacific Extension from the Milwaukee Road, which the the Mil Pacific Extension for the Milwaukee Road had a lot of problems. Um, you know, it was poorly maintained. It was abandoned eventually by the Milwaukee Road. But I'm going to say that they keep it. And the reason I want to do that is because the real Northwestern had a, a cool uh, Falcon service that they ran. It was an intermodal service where from where they interchanged with the UP in Fremont, Nebraska, all the way to Chicago. Uh, and I thought it'd be cool to kind of honor the fact that the Northwestern really pushed the envelope and really kind of, you know, did some things to kind of set the stage for modern intermodal freight and say that they, the Falcon service existed, but it ran all the way from the Pacific Northwest ports to Chicago. And the reason why that's important is because of when Powder River coal becomes a thing. In the real world, this is kind of where their destiny with UP starts. Because in the real world, when Powder River Coal became a big deal, the Northwestern did not have the means to get that coal to Chicago. The, the cowboy line in Nebraska was in terrible shape, and they didn't have the resources to either you know build a new line or refurbish the cowboy line. They couldn't do it. So they, they were forced to partner with the UP to get that coal farther east. And again, that was kind of the beginning of the end for the Northwestern, really. So in my timeline, because they consolidated their lines and made the Grand, the you know, the Granger line really still work, because they had this profitable intermodal line from the Pacific Northwest to Chicago, they could develop their own sole Powder River line and use that as an additional revenue stream to keep them, you know, chugging along into the 21st century. So the Northwestern stays strong and independent. Uh, the UP, they still get to Chicago, but that's because they acquire the Rock Island. You know, the Northwestern never protests that because they don't need to in this timeline. They're sitting healthy. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of the, that's setting the stage for the world that my layout is in. 
Now, like I said, I, I want a modern layout, but I'm going to set it 10 years in the past. So we're, it's going to be in uh, basically 2012, because by the time I get this layout operational, it'll be, it'll be 2022. So 2012 is where this is going to start, um, mainly just to give companies time to release the models that I need. I really want to do like a Utah belt style thing, because I love that layout. I would love to keep moving the time forward. Um, and by setting it back, you know, delaying the start by 10 years, it gives, again, it gives me a, a chance to figure out, you know, what what rolling stock I need to acquire, what locomotives, all that stuff. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I, I want commuter rail, and that's super easy, thanks to Kato. There's plenty of Metra locomotives and coaches, so that's not a big deal at all. I also decided to add one last little fun piece to my alternate history and include uh, Bottle Railroad or Magazine's club layout, the Milwaukee Racine and Troy. So they did a special issue about their club layout recently, and they included this system map that showed how the MRNT line gets down to Rockford, Illinois. And I thought, you know, if the if the Northwestern and Milwaukee Road sold off a number of lines, it would make sense that a railroad like the MRNT would build themselves up in part by acquiring some of the lines that the CNW abandoned. So I decided then, um, with that stage fully being set, to zero in on the town of Harvard, Illinois. Uh, it's the last town on the uh, Northwest Metro Line, so I get my commuter service. And it also has a small yard. Here's the, uh, here's the Google Maps uh, picture of, of Harvard right now. Um, but those tracks are basically used in the real world uh, as holding tracks for, for Metro trains. Now, if you notice, off to... Uh, the left there, what's left of one of the CNW lines uh, goes a few miles west of town now and it's operated by a short line to service. There's a large grain facility just west of town. But I thought as I was looking at that, you know, what if the MRNT acquired that line and that was actually part of their main state line that runs to Rockford? Because when I looked back at that map in Model Railroader, the MRNT's mainline runs very close to this abandoned CNW route. And in fact, it caught my eye when I looked at the map. It shows that the Milwaukee, Racine, and Troy passes through the town of Poplar Grove, Illinois. And when I was doing my initial research to try and find where I wanted to set the stage for this, for this layout, uh, I was looking at a map of Illinois rail routes in 1970. And the only railroad that had a line that goes through that town was the Chicago Northwestern. So it it fit well with my story uh, that you know the MRNT would acquire this line to build up their main line. Uh, it would set up a cool interchange situation, and it would allow for a little more traffic and some cool operations between the two railroads. So version one of the Wisconsin division layout in end scale will focus on the town of Harvard. Now, one of the unique things about the Harvard subdivision of the Wisconsin division is there's really not much uh, freight traffic on there anymore, and this is this is. Uh, graphic showing you, you know, maybe maybe a day uh, in a day you'll have one or two freights if you're lucky. So uh, again, that fills my, I told you at the start of the video, I really want to see, you know, longer trains running over scenery. Uh, this is going to fit that. There's a grain train that runs to that complex just west of Harvard that I mentioned. So on my layout, the CNW would have trackage rights on the MRNT to get to that uh, grain facility and work the site. There's also the occasional through train that goes up to the yard in Janesville, Wisconsin and back. Um, and there's also a local that actually comes down from Janesville and runs back down the line to service customers near Harvard. Um, and obviously on top of that, there are plenty of commuter trains that run through and that will certainly, that alone will keep things busy when it comes time to do operations. Now, uh, in addition to those trains running on the northwestern tracks. I wanted. I want to have an MRNT through train, probably intermodal, because I just I love the look of modern intermodal trains. Um, as well as I would like to do a smaller manifest train that drops cars off on one of the interchange tracks for the CNW local to pick up. And the timing of this is great because the model uh, model railroader just announced they're doing their next uh, project layout is an N scale MRNT, and they're going to do a special release. Uh, Atlas is going to do a special release of another MRNT painted locomotive, so I'm going to definitely grab that one and use that for the manifest train. So I'm going to start off by building two 4x2 modules that I will, you know, fully scenic and everything, and that'll be the main center of operations. And here's 
uh, here's the main plans for them. Now, I'll eventually build additional models so that way there can be staging areas and we can even maybe do some continuous running. Um, but that will be, will be later. My plan for all the modules is to store them with uh, legs, the legs folded up into the modules themselves. I have this great space above my shelving units in the garage where I can easily slide them in. Uh, and then when I want to do a session, I'll just set them all up in my garage. I, I'll pull my car out, I'll have plenty of space, and it'll be awesome. So you can see, I'll go back here to the map image of actual Harvard. You know, here's, here's actual Harvard, Illinois, and then here's my plan for these two modules. And you'll see it's, it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty good adaptation and, and, uh, of the actual Harvard space. Obviously with the addition of the MR and T interchange. Uh, and a few more tracks to help with operations. So there will be one uh, dedicated interchange track to hold you know, freight cars. Uh, maybe the Northwestern drops a few off for the MRT to pick up or vice versa. Uh, Metro is gonna get a dedicated track to hold a train and then there will be a third track there that you know sometimes Metro will use, sometimes the Northwestern uses. It depends on time of day and need. Uh, the outbound track, the track headed towards Janesville, which remember the CNW runs left-hand main, not right. It's another cool thing that makes them unique. That will be what links up the MRNT line uh, to the MRNT line, so that way they can run their grain, their grain train down to that facility I've been talking about. So I think that's going to keep me plenty busy. I think it's going to be a great kind of first step before I build my my permanent layout here in a few years. And, and that's the introduction. That's really all I wanted to use this first episode for was to explain the concept, kind of geek out about my alternate history, geek out about my vision a little bit. Um, next episode, I'll walk you through my locomotive and rolling stock roster that I have so far. I've also been doing some practice modules to help kind of build up some of my skills, you know, with ballasting and scenery, like static grass and stuff. And, and, uh, and I also want to use next episode to talk about one of the things I'm most excited about uh, with my layout, you know, I'm going to take full advantage of the fact that it's an alternate history and I'm going to feature the return of private Chicago Northwestern passenger service on the layout. Uh, but I'm going to talk more about that on the next episode. So that's it. That's all I've got. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you back here for episode two.